The U.S. Compact of Free Association came into existence following World War II and on the heels of the Cold War. The countries that signed are the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and Palau. Under the compact, the U.S. provides billions in monetary aid and access to several U.S. federal agencies. In return, the U.S. is allowed to base its military for defense of both the mainland and each participating country. At the outbreak of World War II, Japan had control in each of these places. But after the U.S. defeated Japan, they each fell under the jurisdiction of the U.N. as trust territories, where the U.S. was heavily involved in their development. Finally, each became a sovereign nation, but in agreement with America's compact. We started our journey in the Marshalls, on Majuro Atoll. As the Cold War was ramping up, the U.S. decided to seek approval of the people of the Marshall Islands for nuclear testing. All right now, James, will you tell them that the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind, and that this experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. Already good, and they're willing to go, and everything is caught back. The islands were chosen due to their isolation in the middle of the Pacific. The U.S. offered compensation and relocation for this purpose, promising the Marshallese the testing was for the good of mankind. Happy to help the Americans who had just won World War II and not aware of the full ramifications of their choice, the nuclear explosions caused radiation and other long-lasting effects to the people and the environment. Such as on Runet Island, where nuclear waste from the Ivy King bomb is stored haphazardly, even today. Jack Needenthal arrived on the Marshalls 37 years ago from Pennsylvania as a Peace Corps volunteer and never left. He worked as a liaison for the Nuclear Your Trust Fund, recently and being called to testify the before the U.S. Senate. The trust, I mean, it's, it's outrageous that Interior would do this to us. That trust fund, those people worked so hard for this. They provided $220 million over 30 years. And now runs the Marshall's Red Cross Society. Honestly, the, the, the Cold War was fought and won on the shores of Bikini and anyway, talking to the Marshall Islands, because their whole reasoning, and, and, and this isn't my idea, I've, the, the, there was actually a Bikinian uh, named Lori K. Sabuki who rolled, wrote their anthem and everything, really cool guy. He'd say this all the time to the media. He said, look, they came to us and they said, we want to test these weapons because they're saying it will end all world wars and it's for the good of mankind. And he goes, well, there haven't been any more world wars. There haven't been any more nuclear weapons used. What they saw in Bikini and the devastation that was wrought on Bikini scared the hell out of everybody. So they don't use them. There were 67 weapons tested out here, 23 of them were on bikini, but 75% of the yield of these weapons was on bikini. And 20 of those 23 were hydrogen bombs. People don't realize that, that most of those weapons were just massive, you know, like the Bravo shot was a thousand times what Hiroshima was, and blew a hole in the reef a mile wide and, you know, snowed on people all over the northern marshals. And the reason why I always agree to do these interviews is because you can't let this kind of story die. It's a rea reality check for the rest of the world. When big, giant governments start doing these awful things to these innocent people who have no way of defending themselves, you've got to keep this kind of story out there. I like that tattoo. Huh? Is that a well, I wanted to prove to the world that I'm a warrior, you know? Is that a warrior tattoo? It will. It's my clan tattoo. Cool. I like it. And, you know, as a fighter, I was fighting for life yeah. because I was under chemotherapy. The name of the atoll? I'm a mayor. I'm mayor of Likieb Atoll. It's about 105 miles north of here. Did your parents uh, tell you? Did they see any of the bombs? My mom saw the bomb. She was under the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. And she would say, "Yeah, don't be surprised if." You know, just expect the worst. 
this is her telling. So, yeah. so we're, you know, what can we do? We've already been yeah, exposed. So you just have to live. It's really sad. Why in the middle of the Pacific, you know, we're on the wrong side of the world. That is probably why they put the testing onto us. Innocent. So untouchable, we knew nothing. We didn't know that something would happen to us in, after so many years. At least they would have tell us that uh, you're gonna have a defected child, you know, if you're gonna be pregnant to a, a baby. You know, a lot of them, most of the women from my island at all, they gave birth to fish to the devil, to skip jacks, you know, yep. uh, crepes, coconuts. But they hide those evidence because they were really shy. They didn't want to embarrass themselves. I, I don't understand what you mean, give birth to those things. You mean deformed when children? Deformed, or? deformed, yes. Like the grapes. That's my good comparison of a jelly baby. When they come out, all bubbly up. When they come, they, um, uh, they uh, maybe only live for a few hours. After the nuclear testing, a lot of women were born with deformed children with, uh, and a lot of them without bones. Therefore, they coined the phrase uh, jelly babies and uh, what Veronica was basically saying was that uh, the women were embarrassed, so they hid all of this stuff. They buried them and they hid them and they didn't want anybody to know about uh, what they gave birth to. So in terms of history, history a little bit, uh, the Spanish were here. Um, after the Spanish were the Germans. And then eventually the Germans legalized it in terms of being a territory. I think that was in 1885. And then after World War I, of course, the Japanese were here. And uh, the Germans had to leave because of the war. And they were here, of course, until the end of World War II or towards the end of World War II. And then eventually the United Nations formed the trusteeship of the Pacific Islands. But the Marshall Islands declared itself a republic in 1979, even though it was still under the trusteeship. And then, of course, in 1986, it became basically an independent nation. And I think around 1991, it became a member of the United Nations. So there's, there's three main types of um, traditional canoes. Um, but some of the unique things is the outrigging. And the outrigging on a Marshallese canoe is very distinct. And anytime you see that pattern of outrigging, you know it's a Marshallese canoe. Uh, the purpose of one island in Majal, it's us using the canoes, bringing back our ways of navigating and helps bring back our culture. We use our ends and we don't just sit there, just like you said, watching TV. But uh, eight hours a day, we walk around like building canoes. We, yeah, back in the days, they usually spirit and feelings, like heart feeling that give the people going. It, whenever you build canoe, he doesn't want to stop. Like it's, it's a good spirit. Yeah. There's a saying here, at the it's when a man doesn't want to go away from his canoe. Once he started, he's going to finish it all the way. We call it adhikiraka. It's like addiction. So it's much better than the drugs. Yeah, much, much better. <laughs> I, I'm a counselor here, a substance abuse counselor. And this program helps uh, young people, men and women, uh, those that they drop out, out of high school. So we bring them in. Bring them in train them, uh, help them get to know about canoes, building canoes, why canoes are really important, because uh, uh, it's 
generation, they know about canoe. But the young ones like me, before I came in here, I didn't know about canoe. Uh, from what, what I believe, young people now they here in the Marshall Islands, they use substance abuse because they don't have anything to do. They don't have jobs, they don't go to school, they don't hang out with friends. And they only hang out with friends to drink and use substances. So by bringing them into this program, they build canoes, so they have something that they, they, they are doing every day. So the, this is our museum where we put all the products that our trainees uh, make every, every year. Because every year we have training for young people, like those that they trap out. So we bring them in, they train, and this is what they, they do every, every year. Like Ranege uh, Coconut Crater and the frames. Uh, they even build canoe models, big ones. Uh, this picture is for all of Marshall Islands. And it's like a map. It's our map. Our elders, they use this picture or the map to navigate. The, as I said before, one of the uh, skills or knowledge that the Marshallese are noted for is navigation. And they made these stick charts. These are not maps that you take out and use like we use Western maps or uh, contemporary maps. They were maps where you learn the currents or the swells. And you memorize this and you learn their names and all aspects of them. And then you went out and you learned how to see them. So this one is called a Y baby. And this one I know the most about. Um, and it was, like I said, a teaching tool. And this shows the pattern of the currents around an atoll. And it can be in different directions. But we could say that the atoll is here in the middle. And as you get closer, you're going to feel these three swells, which are called Noah and Alican Bar, which means the currents behind the uh, reef, on the other side of the reef, on the ocean side. And then you had these swells or currents. I don't know their proper name in English, whether it should be currents or swells. In Marshallese, it's the same word as waves. And as you, if you were sailing along and you would feel this place where the two swells cross and your boat would be moving uh, a lot. And the traditional navigators could lay at the bottom of the boat and tell you where land was by the movement of the boat or by the movement of the canoe. And there are still a few left. Um, I was adopted by a Marshallese family in 1969 and my Marshallese father is still alive. He's in his 80s and he, he knew this. You know, he's, he'd never been out of the Marshalls. I said, well, could you sail to, to the US? And of course, in our minds, we know where it is in respect to where we are. And he said, yes, I would know when land's coming, even though it's a huge continent, as opposed to a little island, by the movement of the boat. But I said, would you know how far north or south you were? And he said, no. So again, it just depends on what the sails can tell you. Um, I came out here in 1981 as a Peace Corps volunteer, and when I wound up becoming the very first Secretary General of the Marshall Islands Red Cross Society, which I really enjoy doing. It's less, stref less stressful, I think, and at this point more rewarding as we build this up. We got recognized by the International Committee of the Red Cross just last December. We're the 191st country. And um, so I think the Marshall Islands has a lot to offer the Red Cross and, and mostly what we're doing now. The big mission we have for our own people here is getting them ready for disasters that unfortunately I am sure will begin coming as a result of climate change. There's been some very weird weather patterns out here the past, you know, I would say five or six years. It's really changed a lot. We've had a lot of inundations. Um, uh, especially where the Bikinians live now in Kili, there's been some really bad inundations of water. We've had it here in Majuro. And sometimes it's, it's a sort of a hard thing to get across to people. It's like trying to imagine your child getting hit by a car or something. You just don't want to think about it. You don't believe it's going to happen. But you still have to prepare for those kind of eventualities. So we've been working really hard on that. But it looks like it's all dried up. You can see all the sand and stuff that's washed in from the all out in the road here. <clears throat> this was all under about over a foot of water this morning. We 
toured inside the Majuro Lagoon before heading across the ocean to Arno Atoll. They sometimes see ghosts. Um, well, there is a cemetery. Yeah. That place is called Demon Island because when people go back and forth between the islands, they see demon. They actually see ghosts. <laughs> and that's why they go, and because it's just for the graveyards, it's just for the family to bury their relatives. Majuro and Arno are two of the many atolls in the Marshalls. An atoll is the rim of an ancient blown volcano that has slipped below the ocean, only its coral rim peering above the ocean waves. For an atoll to remain above water, continued erosion must be at a rate slow enough to permit reef growth up and out to replace the lost height. Excessive development might prevent such growth. Arno Atoll is a pristine Eden. It's like stepping back in time. There is no electrical grid, no cars, no significant development, other than homes, a school, and radio tower, and therefore no need for a seawall. Arno is um, like twice the size as Madro. How many people live here? Maybe 800. Hmm. So you have 800 people, but it's much bigger. Yeah. Morning. 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 Cool hair, dude. <laughs> they ask them and then dry them. And these are um, dryers. This is copra? Yeah. Copra, or the meat of a coconut, is the Marshall's primary commercial agricultural product. Here, you can. That's how they, they cut the meat out and dry it up. So they got electricity on this island? Or? Um, solar. These are. Um, so there's no electrical grid here. No. No electrical. Um, there's an elementary school down this side and some homes. Some families live on this side. And um, they raise pigs and stuff on the other side. Yeah. If you guys are interested in or whatever. I said, this is why there's a creator. Look at this, it's beautiful. This is one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen. And we're the only ones here. It's amazing. Leaving the marshals for the Federated States of Micronesia, we flew on one of the world's most unique aviation routes, United's Island Hopper, which connects several of America's compact countries and territories. 